Yesterday you were hearing about the description in the Bhagavatam of the hot season and then the rainy season and then the autumn, the Sharad, the Ritu. This is all a description of God's Dham, of Sri Krishna's divine abode. When we talk about Krishna, his form, his names, his leelas, his virtues, and his dham, and all of his divine associates, the gopis, gwadvals, they're all one. So, I've mentioned to you a few times this week that the process of doing bhakti means meditating on Krishna's leelas. But meditating on his leelas means you can meditate on his form, you could meditate on his abode, you could meditate on his divine associates. They're all one. Those six things, Nam, Rup, Leela, Guna, Dham, Jan. Name, form, virtues, Leelas, abodes, and the divine associates. So hearing about his abode means we can use that for meditation. That when you want to sit and meditate on Krishna, it depends on your own nature of your own mind. Maybe it's easier for you to meditate on Krishna's abode and just feel that, oh, he's somewhere nearby, but you're not actually thinking of his form in your mind. That is also just as valid a way of meditating, just as valid a way of doing bhakti. Because his dham and Krishna are one. Natad bhasayate suryo nashashanko napavaka yadgatva nanivartante tad dham paramam In the Gita, he tells Arjun that my abode is not under Maya. It's beyond Maya. The Mayak sun, Mayak moon, Mayak stars, they don't shine in my divine abode. It's lit up by its own divine effulgence, its own divine light. So Sri Krishna's abode is, in fact, the expansion of his own self. He himself has become his abode. And when he descended on this earth planet, you can say that although the earth was the same earth we have here, but that area where he did his leelas became just like his divine abode. So the description in the Bhagavatam, in fact in the Bhagavat Mahatmya, the description of braj, the definition of braj means, comes from Sanskrit, which actually means vyakti, which means that Krishna himself is everywhere in Braj, in every particle of Braj, Krishna is there. In other words, Braj is another form of Krishna. So even if you just meditate on the description of the hot season, or the rainy season, or the autumn season, in Vrindavan, in, uh, which is described in, in the Bhagavatam, your meditation will purify your heart. Because you're meditating on Krishna by meditating on his abode. So if that appeals to you, you can think of that beautiful description and keep meditating on that. Of course, it's helpful to have kirtan going when you're meditating. But if you don't have kirtan, maybe you're just, you have some free time in your day, you can just imagine you're sitting in divine Vrindavan for a couple of minutes 
That's just the same as if you're meditating on Krishna's form, of his own beautiful form, is not separate from the form of his abode. So yesterday you heard some, some of the beautiful descriptions of Krishna's Vrindavan abode and the whole Braj area. Today we start from a time when Krishna and the wild balls went out grazing the cows. And they went out very far today. <clears throat> it's the, we're jumping forward to the next hot season in Krishna's seventh year. It's Grishma Ritu and the cows are ranging far and wide looking for nice green grass. So they enter, you know, in how hot the sun is in the hot season. And they enter this forest with big trees that are providing really nice shade. And Krishna says to his friends who are walking with him that look at these trees. Who could express how fortunate these trees are. Look how their life is. He says, you see, these trees, they're taking the sun on them. They take the wind, the full force of the wind. They take the full force of the rain. But they protect us from it. We stay under the trees and we're protected from the sun, the wind, and the rain. But the trees themselves are taking the full force of those natural elements. So Krishna says, look what they're doing. They're helping other living beings. He says, there are many, many life forms on this earth planet. But he says, the trees are so special because anyone who comes to them gets something. Just like anyone who goes to a kind-hearted, wealthy person, no matter what they need, they come away with something. In the same way, Trees are providing shade, shelter from the rain, from the wind. They provide fruits and berries and flowers and their branches and their leaves and their roots are all used for different things. So Sri Krishna tells them that, in my opinion, one's, the, the worth of one's life could be measured by how much they do for other people. So he was teaching his friends the, uh, the importance of being good and helping others by giving the example of the trees. Then uh, some of the Gualbals came up to Krishna and they said, you know what? We're feeling so hungry. We need some food. Can you please do something about this hunger which is torturing us? So Krishna thought of gracing his devotees who were not far away, the wives of some Brahmins who were doing a yajna. So he said to a few of the Gualbals that you go with not too far from here, there are some great Brahmins from Mathura and they're performing Angiras yajna with a desire to go to Swarg. Swarg is where the devatas reside. It's not Krishna's divine abode. Krishna's divine abode is beyond Maya, Swarg is under Maya. So you may have heard some great descriptions of Swarg from scriptures or pundits or any place like that. But Sri Krishna says in the Gita, Yam imam pushpitam vacham pravadantya vipaschitam vedava darata partha nanya daspiti vadina. They are fools who strive to go to swarg. Adhyantavanta evaisham loka karma vinirmita. Dukho darkastamo nishtha chudrananda shucharpita bhagavatam. Here in this verse, Sri Krishna is telling Uddha, later in the 11th canto of the Bhagavatam, that going to Swarg is not so great because the pleasures over there are also limited. Chudra, he calls it, insignificant compared to divine bliss. The pleasures in Swar might be many, many times greater than the pleasures of this earth planet. 
but they're not worth it. It's not worth the effort. You have to do so much effort to get to swear. And what do you get? More temporary mic pleasure. The same thing you're getting here. Just maybe a little higher version of that. But the same problem. Even when you're enjoying in swart, you're still jealous of your neighbor or anyone who has more than you. Indra vanchati brahma padam. Indra himself is jealous of Brahma. He wants to have Brahma's seat because Brahma is higher in status and luxury than he is. So when that's the state of Indra's mind, what could we say about the general public who go over there? So that's why Shri Krishna says it's a foolish endeavor to go to Swarg, although all of those teachings in the Vedas telling how to get to Swarg, it's not that they have no use. They're there for a person who believes he's the body. If you believe you're the soul, then the only thing that could satisfy you is God. But if you're not at that level of understanding yet and you believe yourself to be the body, then you're only going to desire my pleasures. So, okay, strive for swarg, and by striving to go to swarg, the Vedas induce you to do many, many good actions, all kinds of charity, all kinds of uh, good karma. So the Ved is kind of holding swarg as an incentive to induce people to do good actions. It's for agyanis, those who believe themselves to be the body, at least they shouldn't only do bad things in an effort to enjoy the world. Let's induce them to do good in order to gain the higher pleasures of swarg. But they're still agyani because they go to swarg and then they come back here and start again. He nataram va vishanti. Ved says they come back on the earth planet and they are not even guaranteed to be born as human right after coming from swarg. They might end up in a lower species. So those Brahmins, they were nearby and they were doing this great yagya with a desire to go to Swarg, one of the yagyas described in Vedas. But their wives were devotees of Krishna. They had been hearing, because they're from Mathura, they had never met Krishna. But all those leelas, everything you've heard up until today that are described in Bhagavat, they've been hearing those. Being in Mathura, all those stories of Krishna are being told that Mathura is not so far from Raj, from Vrindavan. So they've heard and they have so much love for Krishna in their heart. So Krishna decided to grace them. So he sent some of the boys that uh, those Brahmins are nearby and they're having a yagya. So go to their yagya shala and ask them, or some of just a little bit of the rice that they're going to be offering in the yagya. So those boys went and they did a very respectful pranam and then they humbly, because Krishna also told them, and take my name and Balram's name when you ask for the rice. So they went and they very humbly requested that uh, Krishna and Balram and their uh, coward friends are nearby and they're all extremely hungry. So Krishna has sent us on his behalf to ask you for a little bit of the rice that you're using in your yagya. Those Brahmins were really intent on doing the yagya properly and they didn't want to be disturbed. So in fact, they didn't so much as even acknowledge that the boys were there. They didn't so much as look at them. They just kept doing what they were doing. So the boys came back and told Krishna what happened. So Krishna laughed and he said that you may fail many times at things in your life, but you have to keep trying. If you keep trying, you will become successful. So he said, this time go back and ask the wives of the Brahmins. So the boys went back and they entered the quarters where the wives were. And they barely got half of their story out. As soon as those ladies heard that Krishna is nearby and he wants food, they just scrambled and grabbed up all, never mind bringing a little bit of rice, they grabbed everything they had, all the you know delicacies that had been prepared, and they just rushed towards Krishna. And their in-laws and husbands and brothers and fathers, they're all trying to stop them. <laughs> Where are you going, taking all this food of the yagya? 
but they were like rivers flowing to the sea. They couldn't be stopped. And they just, ignoring everybody's uh, reproaches, they just kept going. So they went and they approached the spot where Krishna was in that forest, actually on the bank of Yamuna. So as they approached, then they saw Krishna there in the shade of those big trees, surrounded by Gualbals. And imagine their excitement. They've been hearing about Krishna. And up until now, you can say they've been drinking the nectar of Krishna's leelas through their ears. Now they were drinking the nectar of his beauty through their eyes. So they saw Krishna standing there with his peacock feather crown, his uh, golden ear pendants, his uh, locks of, of black hair kind of coming across his cheeks, his beautiful shiny pitambar, and he was standing like this with one arm on one of his gualbal shoulders, and in the other hand he had a lotus, and with the stalk of that lotus he was just you know playing with it like that. So they just came, and when they saw it, they just kind of stopped. And for a long time, they just stood looking. Until Krishna said, Swagatam, Swagatam. He welcomed them. And he acknowledged their devotion, saying that, You came to me ignoring all your fears, all your worldly attachments, not minding who is going to stop you, who is going to say anything to you. You put me above all of that. Just like Krishna said in the Gita, Sarva dharman parityajya mamekam sharanam braja aham tvam sarva papebhyo mokchaishyami ma shucha and the same thing in the Bhagavatam, he says, Dharman Santyajaya Sarvan Mam Bhajet Sacha Sattamaha. He says, The best devotee is the one who leaves all the other formalities and only loves me. In the Gita, he said, Sarva Dharman, leave all the other dharmas and do one dharma. There's two kinds of dharma. There's apar dharma, which is what the, the Brahmins were doing, following all the rules of the Vedas. And those wives also had a dharma to be involved in that yagya, to help their husbands in any way, to you know be in the family, doing their family duty. That was their dharma. That was apar dharma, or physical dharma. But there's another kind of dharma, which is called paradharma, the supreme dharma. Par means like param, shreshd, spiritual dharma that relates to your soul. And that is only one, of one kind. See, there are many, many rules in aparadharma. Who, what kind of duty you have to your mother, to your father, to your husband, to your wife, to your children, all kinds of duties. But the paradharma is only one. Love Krishna. That's it. That's bhakti. So the paradharma is supposed to supersede the aparadharma. Bhagavatam says, Savai punsam paro dharmo yato bhakti radho chaje. The supreme dharma is to develop love for Krishna in your heart. And if ever the two are not in coordination with each other, how do you decide then what to do? You give preference to paradharma. So Krishna acknowledged that fact, that you had all these other duties, but you realized that your duty to love me was above all of that. So sarvadharman parityajya, you abandoned all of those duties to come to me. That is his final teaching of the Gita, and it's also mentioned at many places in the Bhagavatam. See, there's a difference between abandoning your duty out of laziness or out of fear. If someone doesn't do their dharma for those reasons or out of selfishness, that's pop. That's a sin. They're going against the Vedas. 
But those rules are like preliminary rules. So if you graduate to bhakti and your primary goal is attaining Krishna, you want to love him and please him and you want to meet him in this life. Then it's like you're graduated to a higher level. So when you're in high school, do you follow all the same rules you do when you were in kindergarten? No, there's a different set of rules. So similarly, <clears throat> the one who's practicing paradharma is not bound by all the same rules as the one following aparadharma. He may follow them, but they don't come before paradharma. Meaning physically, he may be observing all of those duties, all the dharmas. But in his heart, he's only loving Krishna. So technically, he's only following paradharma. And if there's ever any clash between the two, he's not punished. It's not punishable that, oh, you didn't do this duty because, you know, you went to Krishna and you, you didn't listen to your husband's, your husband's orders or your parents' orders. So isn't that pop not to listen to them? Yes, of course it is. But because that was becoming an obstacle on their way to get to Krishna, so Krishna rewarded them. He didn't punish them. So that's how the, the paradharma and aparadharma work together. So he said, you came to me and why not? He says, I am the soul of all the souls. So I am the most beloved of every soul. And he said that the one who has correct knowledge, the one who understands the meaning of his life, he will love me as his priyatam. Those, those are his words. He says, love me as your priya, as your beloved. And ahai tukim, ahai tukya he tells those ladies that love for me should be selfless, meaning without any demand or personal desire, but instead a desire to serve and make Krishna happy. That's true bhakti, the highest form of bhakti. And it should be without any kind of uh, holding back or double-mindedness or just wholehearted surrender to Krishna. So this is what he explained to those ladies. And then he said to them, smiling, that, uh, but how are your husbands going to uh, finish their yagya without your help? So you should go, you have came, you met me, you had my darshan, now you can go back. So they said, Krishna, why are you talking like this to us? <laughs> I said, we left all of that and came to you. Are they going to accept us back now? He said, don't worry about that. He said, you surrendered yourself to me. This whole world depends on me. Celestial gods depend on me. Every soul depends on me to give him life. And you have surrendered yourself to me. So what to say of your family and your husbands? The whole world will honor you. So don't fear, you can go ahead, go back. So they went back and he said, don't worry, you will have my darshan again very soon. So they went back and when they returned, nobody said a thing to them. Nobody scolded them, nobody rejected them. They just came back, the yagya was finished. And after the yagya was finished, then their husbands, those Brahmans, they realized, what did we do? Krishna was asking for something from us and we just took him to be an ordinary boy? Look at our wives compared to us. We have studied Vedas, we've done so many yagya, so many sat karma. We're so knowledgeable, people come to us, look to us as teachers, we had a high and noble birth. What was the use of all of that when we don't have love in our heart for Krishna? 
In our hearts we're turned away from Krishna and we yet we have all these other qualities. So shame on our high birth, shame on our learning, shame on our rituals, shame on our good karma and high praises to our wives. They don't have any such knowledge of the Vedas. They don't have any such knowledge of how to perform all of these rituals. They have no such learning, yet they have bhakti for Krishna in their heart. So they are far above us. So again, even these Brahmins now are pointing out the difference between apar and paradharma. The wives had pure bhakti for Krishna, yet their husbands were perfectly following aparadharma, yet they forgot the most important thing. Vasudeva para veda, Vasudeva para makha. Bhagavatam says, Krishna is the origin of the Vedas, where all of those rituals are described. He's the goal of the Vedas. He's the goal of all of those rituals and act good karma. So how can you forget him and think you're doing something good by following all of this? So they repented and they, they said, we are so lucky to have wives like this who have love for Krishna and they showed us our fault. They said, imagine Krishna doesn't need anything from anybody. He has Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, serving him and desiring to press his feet. Yet. He sent someone to us to beg for a little bit of rice, and we didn't realize how he was gracing us through that. Yet, he graced us anyway. He opened our eyes, and now we realize. So in this way, those Brahmins were also graced by Shri Krishna. The last Leela that I'm going to share with you in this series happened not long after that, in the autumn, Shri Krishna noticed one day, he saw these big preparations going on in Nandaga, in the village where they lived. And he came up to his father and some of the elders and he asked that, uh, although Krishna knows everything, but he wanted to arrange for this Leela to take place. So he says, uh, what's, what's going on, Father? Why all the preparations? It looks like you're getting ready for a big puja. Who are you going to be worshipping? Son, we're going to worship Indra. It's a tradition in our family for as long as we can remember. At this time of the year, we, we do puja to Indra. So Krishna said, Father, why do we do puja to Indra? Oh, because Indra is the celestial god of rain. And we depend on the rain because our cows need to eat the grass and the grass won't grow unless we get the rain. And the rain also makes uh, all the crops grow. So we pray to Indra and he makes it rain and everything goes on nicely. So Krishna had in his mind that he wanted to cause Indra to get angry. He had a reason for it, but he thought, this is a good way. I'm going to also grace Indra and teach him something and teach all of these Brajwasis something. So he said, Father, Indra makes it rain, but Father, people suffer or enjoy in this world according to their past karma. So if something good is going to happen to them or something bad is going to happen to them, it's already decided by what karma they did in their previous lifetimes. So what does Indra have to do with that? If it's going to rain, it's going to rain. If it's in our bhagya to have good rain, it will rain. If it's not in our bhagya, it won't rain. And it's not because of Indra, it's because of our past actions. And if someone says God gives the rain or doesn't give the rain, then God does, or God gives pleasure or pain, okay, but how? According to our past actions. He does it exactly according to our karma. He gives us pleasure or 
loss according to our past actions. So, Father, tell me, what does Indra have to do with any of that? Whether Indra is here or not, that will go on. Father, we depend on the cows. For generations, our only means of livelihood is taking care of the cows. And the cows, they depend on, on the green grass, and one of the places where we find the best green grass is on Govardhan Hill. So, Father, why don't we take all of this Samagri that you are going to use to worship Indra, and instead we do puja of the cows, of Govardhan Hill, and of the Brahmins. So they all agreed. Well, his father and all the elders, they liked the sound of that. So I said, okay, let's do that. So Krishna organized all of that. He explained to them how we were going to do this, and they all went to Govardhan Hill, and they offered all kinds of food and sweets that they had prepared originally for Indra. Now they were offering it to Govardhan Hill. They did puja of the cows, go puja. And after that, Krishna led them on Parikrama around Govardhan Hill. And at the same time, Krishna appeared on top of Govardhan Hill as Giriraj, like uh, the Govardhan Hill personified, you could say. And in that form, Krishna ate all whatever had been offered. And in his other form, Krishna did pranam and said, Jai Ho Giriraj Maharaj Ki. And he led Jwasis in Parikrama and in praising Giriraj Maharaj. So he appeared on the mountain and he was down there with the Brajwasis. So in this way they did Govardhan Puja. And we know that this Puja happens the day after Diwali. That's when we celebrate it even up till today. So that's when it happened at that time as well. Now after this happened, Indra felt so insulted that these Brajwasis have been worshipping me in this way for generations and on the word of some little Chopra, some little boy who thinks he knows something, they just like that gave up worshipping me? What kind of strength do they think this boy has that they're taking a shelter in him and ignoring me? No, this cannot be. I'm going to teach them a lesson. So Indra called all of his servants. Samartak. Samartak, he makes it rain during Pralay. Otherwise, he doesn't come out. The uh, Marut Garn, all of Indra's clouds, they are involved in like day to day operations, you can say. But this Samartak, he only comes during Pralay, when the whole earth is going to get flooded. He comes and he causes it to rain, huge, heavy rainfall. So Indra said, you go to Braj and you make it rain. You make it rain like it's Pralay. And I'm coming on Airavat with my uh, Marut Garn, all his other servants. And we're going to also see what we can do to teach this little Krishna a lesson. So they made it rain, and it rained so hard that everything was blowing around and getting soaked. The Brajwasis and all the cows, they were just shivering and cold. It was, the force of the wind was so much, the raindrops were so huge coming down. It was such a heavy storm, thunder and lightning. So they all came running to Krishna. So Krishna said, my Brajwasis need help, and look, they're freezing cold, Their whole, all their possessions are about to float away in all of this water, <clears throat> I have to do something. So, just like a boy would pick a lotus flower out of a pond and just hold it up, Krishna went to Govardhan Hill and that playfully, that easily, he just lifted up Govardhan Hill with his left hand on his pinky, and just on the nakhun, on the, on the nail of the pinky of his left hand, and he just held it there like that. And he said, Oh, Brajwasis, come, bring all your cows, all your children, <laughs> all your possessions. Come under, come under Govardhan Hill. Just come and sit, relax. So they all brought everything, and they came under Govardhan Hill. 
And Krishna using his yoga maya shakti, before that they were feeling so tired and hungry and cold. Once they were under Govardhan Hill with Krishna, even though they stayed there for seven days and seven nights, because Indra kept making it rain. Yet none of them felt hungry, and no one was, you know, going on the side and, okay, let me start a pot of dal, and let's see if we can feed people. No one was cooking or eating or drinking anything. Yet none of them felt hungry, none of them felt tired, they all were only enjoying their time under Govardhan Hill with Shri Krishna. So in this way, those seven days passed. And after seven days, Indra realized, he started to see Krishna's power. Look what he's doing. He's holding up Govardhan Hill and he protected all of Braj, all of the Brajwasis. My power is nothing in front of him. Oh, I made a big mistake and he stopped the rain. So then Krishna saw the sky is clearing, the clouds are going away, the sun is coming out, so he told the Brajwasis, okay, okay, it's okay now, you can go, you can go out. The rain is done. So all the Brajwasis came out and then Krishna just playfully, easily, effortlessly put down Govardhan Hill. Indra, you all know Indra came to Krishna after that, but he didn't come right away. Not in front of everybody, he was too embarrassed. He waited until Krishna was in some private place, and then he came to Krishna privately, and he bowed down, he touched his own crown to Krishna's feet, and he said that, uh, Krishna, I believed myself to be like the supreme god of this world. But now I realize I'm just one of your servants. I made a big mistake. I didn't, I, I forgot in my own pride of my own status of being Indra, I forgot my place and I forgot who you were. So please forgive me and thank you for gracing me by doing this so that I would come to my senses. So Krishna said to Indra, Tam bhranshayami sampadhyo yasya che chamyanugraham He says, yes, this intoxication of the pride of wealth and power. He says, this is very damaging to a person's mind. In the intoxication of uh, that pride a person feels when they have power over others, when they have some high status or some fame, they have great wealth, all of them kind of tend to go together. Then he forgets about God, for one thing, because just like Indra, he starts to feel like, I have the power, I can do anything. Whatever I need to do I can with my money, I can just make it happen. I can accomplish anything in this world. He starts to feel like he himself is God. And he also starts to disregard the, the well-being of other people because he can't relate. If he also feels hungry and goes without food, then he has compassion, he has empathy for people who don't have enough food. If he has to sleep out in the cold sometime, then he has empathy for people who don't have a house. But if he's lived his life in luxury his whole life, then it's hard for him may disregard the well-being of other people. And more importantly, he disregards the need to be humble before God and to surrender to God. So Krishna says, if I want to grace someone, I take away that thing that gives him such pride. Sukha ke maathe silapare Namahiyate jaya balihari va dukha ki jo pal pal naam rataya. Ramayan. Tulsidas Ji says, let that thing that gives me pride or gives, gives me any kind of feeling that makes me forget Ram, let that thing be taken away from me. No matter how great of a thing it is, let it be taken away if it makes me forget Ram's name. 
And no matter how bad the suffering, if it makes me remember Ram, then I am buddy hard on that suffering. I am so happy to have that suffering if it makes me remember Ram. So Sri Krishna told Indra that if I want to grace someone, I start taking away the things that make them forget me. Tam bhranshayami. If they have some high post or high status, I make them fall from that. So then they'll realize, they'll come to their senses, that intoxication of that pride will leave them. And then just like Indra, when Krishna knocked him off from his high status, then Indra came to his senses because the intoxication of that pride was gone. And then he realized, oh, Krishna is supreme God. I should surrender to him. I should be humble in front of him. So Krishna told Indra, now you go and you serve me. You do your duty as Indra, as Seva to me. And you remember me all the time. <clears throat> now Kama Dhenu had also come along with Indra. She was sent by Brahma. Kama Dhenu is the celestial cow. The wish-giving cow. So Kama Dhenu was sent by Brahma. You know why? To crown Krishna as the true Indra. Because Krishna, Indra means like the, the king, the owner of, the lord of. So Brahma sent Kamadhenu to first praise Krishna and then to anoint him as Indra. So using her celestial milk, she actually did Abhishek of Sri Krishna. And Indra, using water that Airavat had in his trunk from Akash Ganga, also Indra did Abhishek of Sri Krishna and they accepted him as Indra. And there were some Devarshis there as well, like Naradji, who then said, now Krishna, you have a new name, Govinda. Go meaning cow, or like Gokul, and Inda meaning like Indra, the, the lord of, the protector of. So you are the Indra of the cows, and you are the Indra of this whole brudge. You are the, the beloved owner of, protector of, and lord of. Therefore, from now on, you will be known as Govinda. So this is how Sri Krishna received his Govinda title or name, which he is known by all over the world. Krishna, Govinda, Gopal. And this brings us to the place in Krishna's Leelas right before the Ras Lila, which is going to be the topic of next year's program here. Everything, all of the Leelas you've heard about so far, they're classified as Braj Leelas. And there's a different kind of Leela called Kunj Leela. In Braj Leela, all the different associates, all the Brajwasis take, play, take part in it. So think back to every Leela I told you about. Walbals were always there. Sometimes they were mixed with gopis. Sometimes Mother Yashoda was there. So it's like all mixed together. It's called a general Braj Leela. And that is most of the descriptions in the Bhagavatam are of these, this Braj Leela kind. But there is a higher Ras. It's called Kunj Leela. So in Kunj Leela, only the gopis are there. Gopis and Radha. Gopis are also in the Braj Leelas. But in the Kunj Leelas, Krishna's playmates aren't there. And even, even Mother Yashoda isn't there. Nanda Baba isn't there. Only Radha, Krishna and the gopis. So this, is a, this type of Leela takes more devotion and more understanding to understand to, uh, receive the benefit of. So that's why I'm say, I say that for last, that first we can understand the Braj Leelas, and then after that we can understand something about the Kunj Leelas. We should also know that these Leelas are, be, remember I told you on the first day, they're all beyond human intellect, and they're never meant for an analysis or intellectualizing. They're only meant for remembrance. If you lovingly and faithfully remember them, it purifies your heart. 
So that's what the Leelas are for. This time you heard many, many Braj Leelas which you can use for your own <coughs> devotion, for your own meditation. Along with the meditation, it's good to use Kirtan, any Kirtan that uh, feels good to you. And we have some Kirtan CDs here, which are uh, not the exact ones that I've been singing, but they're similar ones. They're all composed by Jagat Guru Shri Kripaluji Maharaj, sung in a similar way. So they're a very good help in meditation. So you can think of these Leelas and listen to the Kirtan, and that way every day you'll be coming closer to Krishna. And next year when we meet again here, then we can talk about some of those Kunjalilas, and I'll also talk to you about why is Radharani not extensively described in Bhagavatam. Krishna Leelas are extensively described, but Radha is, you can say, hidden in the Bhagavatam. She is not openly described. So why is that so? I'll also be talking about that and who is Radha in next year's class. So now we'll finish with some Kirtan. We'll be singing Bhajo Giridhar Govinda Gopala. Giridhar, the one who held Govardhan Hill. Govinda, you just learned what that name means. And Gopala, the one who cares for the cows. So while we're singing this simple Kirtan of Krishna's names, Try to meditate, think back to all the leelas you heard this week and just try to think of you know, your favorite ones that you want to meditate on and with full effort and concentration, try to absorb your mind in thinking of those leelas while we do the chanting. <laughs>